Hello, good morning, everyone. Okay, uh, quick announcements, a couple announcements. One is regarding our final exam. Uh, I think I talked about this last week. Uh, will be the Monday of the finals week, May 17th. So it will be a week from today. Uh, you'll have a three hour window to do it, uh, plus 15 hours of uploading time. Uh, so it's 195 minutes total. Um, on Grayscope, so you will do the same thing. You will click uh, Grayscope, and then uh, after midnight of uh, the 17th, you will be able to see the exam showing up. Um, so I just wanted to, you will see the instruction within the exam itself, but I want to also make, make announcement. Uh, please uh, write your exam problems on one problem uh, and a different page. So you can use several pages for one problem, but keep the problem separate. Uh, when you upload, you can tell Grayscope, okay, these three pages are for problem three. These three pages are for problem one, like that. So it'd be easier uh, when I grade one problem, I when I click, your problem will already be showing up instead of me flipping through the uh, file to find which uh, which problem it is. Okay, so, um, all right, so that's, that's, uh, that's for that. Also, uh, practice exam and solutions are posted. Um, you really should spend some time to work on it before you look at the solutions. Um, there was, according to our original schedule, there is no class meeting on uh, on Wednesday. That's the last day of class. Uh, but let I wanted to rearrange that so we are better use of our the time we have left. Um, so I will do the content of the Friday's recitation in our Wednesday's class. So still come to class on Wednesday. I'll go over the recitation. Um, and then for Friday, the recitation time, we can use it as an extended office hour. So if you have done your practice exam at the time, you can come in, we can talk about this if you have questions or if you have any questions regarding homework or anything that you encounter during when you're preparing for your exam, uh, you should come on Friday and we can talk about those questions, okay? All right, just those two quick announcements regarding finals and the plan for our lecture this week. Uh, any questions before I move on? All right, so let's do our final bit of our class is Faraday's law. I wanna give you uh, a complete uh, set of Maxwell equations. So what is Faraday's law? How do we express it using equations? The curl of E is equal to? When you have a change in your magnetic field, you get it, the electric field. Okay. Yeah, negative. Okay. Del B del T. Very good, thank you. Uh, curve E is negative DB DT. Now, sometimes we wanted to write this using integral format, so it becomes E dot into DL is the D flux B DT. Or you can write that using uh, E DA over D DT, because the flux is B dot into DL. So that's Faraday's law. So I'm, uh, today we're gonna use that to solve a solenoid problem. Uh, you probably see it in your um, pre-flight as well. So we have a solenoid problem, um, which is, let's see. So this is a solenoid, have a current running through, right? And the B for a solenoid, you probably know, is constant within and zero outside. So B for a solenoid is mu naught n current I is e hat inside and zero outside. Of course, when your current is a constant, your B will stay a constant. But if your current is changing, then your B will be changing. So in which case you will have an induced E field, right? So we wanna be able to um, use this equation to solve for, okay, when I is changing, we should be having an E field and we want to calculate it. So again, uh, recall in this class, we do a lot of uh, analogy problems. 
So even for this one, we can find an analogy problem. So I want to quickly review something that's similar to this. Um, So something similar to this is you have a thick wire with current I running, volume current density running uniformly throughout the wire. And we know that um, we can calculate the B field in this case. And I wanna show that the curl of B is mu naught J, that is Ampere's law. You can see that the mathematical format between these are very similar, right? Uh, B is to E in this case, uh, J is to B in this case. So if we have a problem like this, um, so here your B is uniform. Um, here your, um, hold on, your B is uniform in this case. The right-hand side is uniform. You wanna calculate what is E. So we find a, another problem where J is uniform and we wanna calculate, okay, we solved B already. So the mathematical format for E would be similar to where B was. Okay, so this is an analogous problem. Um, mostly, I just wanted to recall the analogy we used to figure out the direction of B. So this is Ampere's law. The Ampere's law integral format is B dot into DL is mu naught I through. Okay. So remember, there are several arguments that we went through. We said B could be in S direction or phi direction or z hat direction. B could depend on s or phi or z. Not, you know, one or both or many. So uh, remember the argument we went through to, get, to rule out the uh, impossible situations. So first we said B cannot be in the s hat direction because that violates no magnetic monopoles, you will have a non-zero divergence. We also said B cannot be in the Z direction because according to Bill Savar, B is perpendicular to J. So your uh, current is in the Z direction, so your B cannot be also in the Z direction. So only possible situation is for B is in the B hat, right? Uh, and then, for the dependence, we said, well, it cannot have Z or phi dependence because your source is uh, symmetric in Z and symmetric in phi, right? You can look up or down, that is the same wire. You can look around, that is still the same wire. That should not change your B field. So we have talked about these, right? That's why we know to, when, to, when we draw a ampere loop, we want to draw a loop that's going around in this direction, in the phi hat direction so that this becomes B times two pi S. Okay, so that is something we did. Any questions about this, about this part? Because we're going to use the same analogy for our uh, solar noise problem. Any questions? Okay, good. All right, so now it's the actual problem we're trying to solve is this solenoid problem. Uh, we will use the same argument to say, well, what is, is the direction of E? You can see that you probably need, we do E dl equals negative the um, flux over dt, right? So we need to figure out a loop. We need a loop. So what kind of loop should we draw? We need to figure out the direction of E. So let's see. There are three possible directions. Which direction should we rule out? Do you think your E could be in the S hat direction for our solenoid? Again, I'm gonna draw the solenoid again. The B is uniform. And let's say we're trying to find E inside or outside. Could be in the S hat direction, could E in this direction? So if it is in this direction showing that delta E is not zero, you will, if E is like this, that means there is a non-zero divergence, right? And is that okay?
You said there is no rule to say we cannot have an electric monopole, of course, but this is should equal to epsilon over um, rho over epsilon naught. Well, it doesn't really tell you there is no charge. There's no static charge in this case. There's just the current. So, which is against what the problem tell you, right? You shouldn't have um, a non-zero divergence for E. So our E shouldn't be in the S hat direction. Um, and um, you can see the mathematical relationship between these are so similar, right? So you know that, okay, okay so here, it's the curl of B is mu naught J and we said B is in the phi hat, then I can safely assure saying my E is also in the phi hat direction. E is in the phi hat direction. Um, okay. Okay, you, you could you could say that, or you can go back to say, I also don't think it should be in the Z hat because my B is already in the Z hat, right? It's the curl of E is, is equal to DB DT. This one is in Z hat, and there's no way for this to also be in the Z hat, right? Because the curl of something across product gives you a direction that's perpendicular to any of the directions. So uh, E and B could not be in the same direction. They should always be perpendicular. Okay, so I can only have three hat. Um, okay, so which means if I had to draw a Faraday loop, I need a Faraday loop. I need to draw the same one as I had before. This is my Faraday loop. So I'm going to say, uh, okay, EDL is equal to DC DT. So what if I try to do the inside first? Of course, if it is inside, I should have drawn a loop inside, which is a loop outside. This one becomes E2 pi S. Uh, and the phi dt. So let me let me take phi outside to calculate this separate so I don't clutter myself. So phi is a flux, which is BDA. Okay, and uh, B is uniform inside, and this is uh, area, so B times pi S squared is my flux, right? And B is a constant with A, and it's B is equal to mu naught, mu naught N times I. That's a relationship with the solenoid, mu naught N times current I, pi S squared. So D phi DT, becomes mu naught n pi s squared di dt. So if there is a change in i, you have a non-zero um, p field. So I can plug this one back in the side, right hand side, I got e to pi s is equal to negative mu naught n pi s squared di dt. Okay, so I can rearrange a few things, I found E inside the solenoid is negative one over like two pi, uh, pi S squared, right? Yeah, okay, <clears throat> two mu naught and uh, S D I D T in the phi hat, so with the phi hat direction, okay? But notice that uh, what is the final direction of E? We say, when we say phi hat, we just mean that general direction means it could be in phi hat or negative phi hat. That's also possible. So let's see what direction of E will be depending on this entire combination, right? So if your current is increasing with time, which means your magnetic uh, field through and the Faraday loop is increasing. So to fight that change, you want to produce, <clears throat> you want to be able to produce one, yeah. uh, induce current. You want to be able to produce a, a B field that is fighting the change. And in this case, you can see that the I dt is uh, larger than zero if I is increasing. So this is larger than zero, which means our E produced in the negative T hat direction. 
to oppose the change. If your IDT is decreasing, which means the IDT is less than zero, so the field is getting weaker. To fight the change, you don't want it to withdraw, you want it to maintain. So you can see in this case, uh, there's gonna be a negative sign here, negative, negative, so plus if you had, this is also considered to be fighting the change uh, as what Lenz law is representing. So you can see that E is represented by this entire expression and the direction can be positive phi hat or negative phi hat depending on if your current through the solenoid is increasing or is a decrease. So that's inside, we can do the outside. So let's do the outside, the outside uh, E, okay, E, D, L, D, phi, D, T, 2 pi s, um, d, d, t, the flux, right? I, my flux before is this guy, but you can see that the most amount of uh, flux I can enclose is when your s goes to a, because beyond that, you don't have any b field. B field is contained within here. So even if you go to a bigger loop, right, you only have flux here, but not in this gap because there's no B field. So I can do mu naught n i times pi a squared instead of pi s squared, right? So that's the maximum flux I can have. I'm enclosing everything I have. Um, okay, so this becomes the outside negative mu naught n, the i dt, pi a squared over two pi s, d hat. Okay, so you can see that it's the same as you had previously. Um, the, the direction can, can change depending on the i dt. So the direction argument will be exactly the same as before. But uh, isn't this interesting that curl of e is negative db dt, but outside b is zero, and yet e is not zero. So does that seem weird, or do you think, okay, I'm totally cool with it, or do you want me to pause and say a little bit more about the situation? Um, the only reason why I'm comfortable with it is because we understand, or at least, yeah, we understand that the, um, what we're measuring is flux and flux is only being measured to, um, or through your cylinder or your thick wire. Okay. Yes, very good. So you can see that um, when we have seen this before. Um, so I'm glad you don't find this too odd. B is zero, you can plug it in and you get curl of E is zero. So this will tell you that the induced E field has no curl. That is indeed true, but E can still be non-zero. It doesn't have to be zero for its curl to be zero, right? Uh, E is in the phi hat direction, so E is in that direction. But this field has no curl, and that is okay. okay. So you can, if you go back to, if we uh, look at this particular question, this is your pre-flight you have done. Um, B is increasing with time. And what can we say about E field at point P outside of the solenoid? Uh, into the page, out of page, if I say A, B, C, D, E, F. So do you guys think you can quickly um, figure out what the answer is? Okay, Jennifer asked about the diagram. I'm gonna show you the diagram. Uh, do you need this diagram? For my solenoid, my current is running in the phi hat. So my P is pointing up, right? 
This is for a B pointing up. And for an analogous problem where current is running in a Z direction, it also points up, okay? So for this one, which direction is E? I'm gonna ask you guys to vote really quickly. Okay, um, two more seconds. All right, let's see. Okay, so here we are giving a counterclockwise current, a counterclockwise current. My B is pointing up. And this B that's pointing up is increasing. Okay, so we said previously E is negative some constant di dt phi hat. So if this is increasing, if this is larger than zero, it's going to be negative phi hat. If this is decreasing, it's going to be positive phi hat. Given the original current or B, if the original current is counterclockwise and your B is upward, okay? But if your original current is reversed and all of this will be reversed. Okay, all right. So uh, let's see. In this case, V is increasing, right? So your E would be negative phi hat. So your B, your E would be in negative phi hat. So negative phi hat at that point would be into the page or out of the page or left or right. What do you guys think? Out of the page. Out of the page, very good. So it will be out of the page at that particular point. Very good. So can we think of the, um, the, e, the direction of our E field as um, opposing some change? Yes, exactly. It is, it is uh, because you can think of if you have a if you were to give it, E field is, is like potential, right? EMF, it will drive a current. If you were to give a complete circuit, it's going to drive a current. Um, Got it. Yeah, but it's still going to have an E field even if without, if without a uh, current needs to be run on a complete circuit, but it's still going to generate that E field no matter what. If you give it a current, it's going to drive that induced current to produce a B field uh, that is opposing it. The word infinite, okay, infinite long solenoid is, when we have a solenoid, it's always tell you it's an ideal solenoid or infinite, infinite long, just so that when it's infinite long, your B is constant inside, zero outside. So you have such a B field um, that is easy to deal with. If you, you don't have an infinite long, then, then B is kind of something like this. It will be a little bit messy to deal with, um, right? So don't worry too much about this infinite law. Uh, pretty much all the solen solenoid problem we give are for infinite law. Okay, so, and this is really cool, right? This is um, like you're communicating um, 
here through here. I am general, my current is locally, local is here. But through the change that's happening here, I'm producing some E field over here and they're not connected. Isn't that really amazing? Uh, this is through like, you can have a communication with our wires. So there are some application we can do. For example, uh, let's say you have some coil right here. Um, this is a coil. Okay, I'm gonna redraw this diagram a little bit better. Got some coil here, and this is a magnet. So let's say if you have some sound, sound will vibrate and wiggle the coil. The coil will be moving, shaking, uh, which means there is there are magnets, so there will be magnetic flux. The flux through this coil will be changed if you have sound waves wiggling the coil. As a result of that, uh, it will generate some current, induced current in the circuit. And uh, depending on how your sound wave changes with respect to time, that current will also have different, give you different signals, right? So you have uh, a change in flux, give you some induced current. And, um, and this is a device for a microphone and you will be able to hear it, right? So this is a microphone. And you can uh, reverse uh, this device exactly uh, to have another application. So for example, you can decide, okay, to change the current running through the coil because uh, uh, the current carrying wire will, so if you change the current, F equals I L cross P, right? So there is a force acting on the current through a magnetic field. So the force will change. If you have a change in force, then you will wiggle the, uh, the coil, which means you will vibrate and make some sound. So if this device is a microphone, the reverse device become what? An amplifier? Make some sound, what would that be? Like a speaker? Yeah, it will become a speaker. So exact same device, just uh, in terms of not the same device, but in terms of the physics behind it, it's, it's very similar, it's exactly the same. That's a quick application for Faraday's law. And of course we use Faraday's law in many other places um, and in transformers uh, is also another application of Faraday's law. Okay, now let's, um, there are another thing we wanna talk about today uh, is inductance. Okay, so moving on. So let's say we have a loop here, I1, and we have a loop here. This is loop one, this is loop two. And you can see that there is, of course, a B field through loop one. Right. Maybe occurring around this is E1. Uh, and where loop, loop two is, there are gonna be some flux through loop two at the location of loop two. So I'm gonna say phi flux two uh, is flux through loop two due to loop one. The, the B field was produced by loop one. So I'm going to say, okay, define this quantity. And how much B field is produced by loop one? Well, that can be calculated uh, using Bill Savar. We're not going to, we can't really do the calculation, but we can set it up. So this is loop one produce a B field. So this will be where your source is, right? And the location of loop two is where your field is. So to calculate, okay, what is the B here is at this location produced by these sources, right? So you, I1 is your source and this is your location is your curly R. 
You can see this is proportional to I1. The stronger your source, the bigger of a B field it will generate. Um, so that this flux is going to be this B field um, going through loop two. Again, proportional to current one because the big the bigger the current, the bigger the field, the bigger the flux. Um Okay, now we got more space. All right, here let's define a pro uh, proportionality constant, and we will give it a name later. But now let's just call it a constant. It's such a constant to describe the relationship of the flux going through loop two due to loop one. So current one generate a flux and this flux is going through another loop two. And there is a constant describing the relationship between this flux and this current because we already established this flux is going to be proportional to the current, right? The stronger your source, the bigger your flux. And what is the constant? There's some constant to describe that, that particular relationship. Um, so M21, we will derive the exact format for it later, but the constant we call it the mutual inductance constant of loop one and two. So you can see that if I want change, then flux two will also change, then you will, according to Faraday's law, you would have produced a uh, EMF, induced EMF in loop two, okay, inside loop two. So this EMF is d phi two over dt, which is negative m21 d i dt. Okay, if we divide, derive such a constant, the flux is constant times current i, d phi dt become constant d i over dt. M21 is b dA over current i. So you can see that I use phi2, which is this guy, the flux b times dA, and divided by current one, I get this constant. So this B D A over I1. Uh, and this is a flux through loop two. That's why I put the two here and two here and one here. Now one here means that it's the current, it's a field produced by one, the source is one, but it's a flux through another loop, loop two. That's why it's a two here. And you can plug in B, right? We got B uh, is this, you can plug in B. U naught over four pi is a constant. So what B is, is another integral, loop one, which is produced by loop one, DL one, and B will have a current I one. So I one, I one cancels. So leaving me only DL one cross R prescript R over R squared DA two. So what you can probably already see, the current cancels out and all the uh, variable that's left inside are pure, purely geometry. Uh, L1 is the length of loop one, that's geometry. A2, area of loop two, that's geometry. And um, from one to two, the script R, from this loop to that loop, from a source point to a field point, that is designed by geometry. It has nothing to do with how much current you're running here um, in loop one. So it just, just depends on the size of the loop 
the distance between the loops um, and the orientation of the loops. It doesn't, does not depend on the current. So the mutual inductance is a feature is describing uh, one loop in, um, in terms of and another, the sort of uh, how big these loops are and how far away they're from each other and what is the orientation. In your textbook, Griffiths rewrite this formula to make it a little more obvious. So in your textbook, Griffiths wrote, okay, let's continue to modify the expression a little bit. It becomes something like this. We're not going to worry too much about these derivations. Uh, we just wanted to see what it what physics it represents. So this is your mutual inductance. It's the same. Uh, it's the same thing, but just slightly modified expression. Here it looks a little bit more obvious, right? This depends on loop one and loop two um, size, the script dot distance, and there's a dot product. Probably the orientation also matters. So showing that this is purely decided by the geometry uh, of the loop. So have divided that, you can probably see, I can do vice versa. I did, what I did was, okay, there is a current running in I1 and it produced a B field and that B field will give you a flux in loop two. So this is M21. Now, if I do the other way around, I say, well, what if the current is running in I2 and I produce a B field running through the flux in one. So I will write mutual inductance in one, two. Okay. So let's look at this question. Uh, we have two loops here. One is current I, one is uh, one, one is current I2. If I1 is equal to I2, is V1 is equal to V2. So if these two are equal, are these two equal? And the question is, will these two be equal? I'm gonna let you go ahead and vote on this. Um, I think we have time to discuss for a little bit. A couple minutes and then we can come back again.
Okay. Um, five more seconds. Any last minute row? Okay, let's take a look. Here are our results. Uh, majority voted for C actually uh, is always equal. Um, almost equal majority vote for B is equal if the geometry is symmetrical. So shape one and two would be similar shapes, uh, the same shape. A is something you will need to calculate for the particular geometry. All right, so what do you guys think? How do we, is there any equation that we talked about that can help us understand uh, the situation? So if loop one is bigger. Well, we're looking. Too smaller. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, we're, we're looking at the um, geometry of these loops if we're looking, um, specifically if we're looking at the dot product between L1, uh, DL1 and DL2. Um, yeah. We didn't say that the two loops were the same size, but they look pretty equal in terms of size. So we know that they'll carry the same magnitude in circumference. Um, this is just in, in general. These are general shapes. I didn't mean for one and two to be exact the same loop. What if I had drawn two to be different, smaller or bigger? Or if I draw one is a circle and two is some weird shape, would you still have kept the original answer? Uh, yeah, no, I would agree uh, that they would be equal as well. Um, and the reason being is because you can't, I mean, the magnitude of either shape will be, um, will be, I'm, I don't know how to explain that. M2 and, and one, M2 one and M12 will be the same um, for each, um, for each loop or whatever shape you have. Oh, very good. Another way to uh, sort of help us is let's write out M12. According to this equation, it's going to be loop one, loop two, um, DL2, DL1, over script R. Sorry, this is loop one. And you can see they're exactly the same expression. This is exactly the same. So, uh, whether it is a uh, one generate a flux through two or two generate a flux through one, sort of how they impact each other for the flux. Um, it, the constant, the, they're impacting each other with the same constant. Because you can see uh, they all depend on L1 and L2 in exact same way. So how DL1 and DL2 um, influence this constant is they, you can say they have equal weight. DL1 is presented like this, DL2 is presented like this. They can switch directions. They will still affect the final outcome in the exact same way. So whether one is regular or two is irregular, doesn't matter, right? In this case, we can think, okay, well, if one is regular, the B field produced here is different, but the, but the flux also depend on the shape of two. So the shape of two also are taking into account, right? If it's flux the other way around, then the shape of two will affect the B field and the shape of one will affect the flux. So one and two will both uh, affect how the neutral inductance works. So it's always equal, I'm sorry, it is always equal, C is correct. Okay, so this is really a brief uh, introduction on the neutral inductance and that can also be uh, further elaborate onto other applications such as the transformers, right? So for transformers, you will have some kind of potential over here. You can see that they are not connected. They are communicating through each other, just like how uh, through inductance. So the change in over here will in, uh, induce a change over here. And depending on how much wire you have N1 here or you have N2 here, depending on how many loops you have here versus here, you can, uh, you can uh, have an output to be how many voltage you want. You may come in with a high voltage uh, thousand 
floats where you can uh, with an output of a, of a lower volts or vice versa simply by changing the uh, the number of turns in different um, in these two different loops right of course there is a mutual inductance describing the n1 versus n2 n12 or n21 they're exactly the same thing the last bit piece of um, Maxwell equation, the complete Maxwell equations. Um, so you can see so far we have already done these three. We have done static E field, no magnetic monopoles, and this is called Gauss's law, no name law or no magnetic monopoles law. And we have done Faraday's law. So as opposed to the static situations where the static field has always has no curl, right? This is electrostatics. But if you have a change in B field, it can produce an E field. So this is uh, sort of renewed. The last bit piece of the puzzle is Ampere's law. So let's zoom in on looking at the stack. So um, before we look at the Ampere's law, let's do a little bit practice on what happens if you take the divergence of both sides of Faraday's law. So if you take the divergence on both sides, what do you get? Okay, I'll let you guys vote. I think this should be okay if we can just vote here without the discussion. Okay, um, 10 more seconds. All right, any last minute vote? Okay, now I'm going to end this and let's take a look at our results. All right. So we are pretty much tied between choice A and B. Uh, and some of us feel a little bit unsure and that's okay. So it looks complicated, right? Um, there is a divergence, there's also the curl, there's also the time derivative, maybe it's something more complicated that we are ready to handle. Uh, but let's not do this one, let's do this one first. So what if, would it be okay there is a derivative operation with respect to time. There is a divergence operation. So would it be okay if I say this is equal to B dt, the divergence of B? Is that correct? I think that's fine, yeah. Yeah, I would agree too. Okay, and uh, why can't we take the divergence in? I'm sorry. Wait, what's up out there? How do we say this is okay? Why is this okay? Why can't we do the divergence and then do the derivative later? 
I remember from calculus that derivatives are like interchangeable. So I remember when taking like the partial like of x or the partial of y, you can do either or first. So it's the same thing here. It's like a partial of time or the partial or the spatial. Okay. So, yeah, so the divergence is also like taking derivative. The reason I can do one first because the operation, these two operations are totally independent of each other. This one is doing a partial derivative with respect to time variable. The divergence is a space, right? It with respect to your location x, y, z. If you take time, if you do partial derivatives here, it's d d x, d d y, d d z. And this operation is on time only. And these two are totally separate. So doing one doesn't affect the other. So that's why I'm able to do my other operation first and do the time later. So that's why I can justify this is okay. And okay, and now you can see this is no longer complicated because divergence of D is equal to what? Zero. Zero. There is no magnetic monopoles, right? It's one of the Maxwell equations. So this is zero. So the right hand side, if you take the divergence of both sides, the right hand side is zero. Is the left hand side also zero? If Maxwell equation yes. is correct, there should be. And we know this because some math, right? We know the divergence of a curl is always zero. This is from our math. Uh, divergence of a curl of some field vector is always zero, always. So because, so then we get zero equals zero always. And that's interesting, but also expected. Otherwise, the Faraday's law will break. So this is one of the strategy we use to evaluate our Maxwell equations is, well, what if we do that little bit um, play on the Ampere's law? What if we do the same thing here? Let's take the divergence of both sides. What do you think you will get? Okay, quickly, uh, let's vote here. According to the Ampere's law, and we take the divergence of both sides, According to this, the divergence of J should equal to, not according to the actual uh, charge conservation, according to this, what should we get? All right, um, 10 more seconds. Let's go for 10 more seconds. All right, okay, let me go ahead and close this. All right, very good. You can see the divergence of a curl is always zero. That's math. <coughs> So according to this, if this is true, then the divergence of mu naught j should equal to the left-hand side should also be zero, right? This is a constant. So mu naught, <coughs> excuse me, the divergence j should always be zero according to Ampere's law. But what do we know about the divergence of j? Divergence of j is equal to negative u rho dt. This is what we derived about charge conservation. So it's uniformly distributed. Yeah, and is this a problem? Does this create a problem for us for Andrew's law? <coughs> Let me put this this I put it another way. This is an equation. 
we take the left hand side divergence of the left left hand side is always zero the left hand side the divergence of the left hand side is always zero however the divergence of the right hand side is not always zero because it is it's equal to negative u rho dt and rho of course can change with time nobody says it couldn't so right hand side can be zero sometimes but it cannot be zero it may be non-zero at some other times so left hand side is always zero the right hand side is not always zero is that a problem yes it is a problem yes so that is something we say okay ampere law ampere's law now breaks right it breaks when the rho dt is no longer zero when the, it breaks when you have a change in charge uh, charge accumulates with respect to time so there's a problem we have to fix it so that's the last little piece of the puzzle is okay we need to fix ampere's law um, to make it correct so one way to look at okay it seems to break when this one uh, when rho is changing with respect to time. So we want to find a situation when such thing happens. So you want it to charge to accumulate over time or charge to decrease over time. The natural place to look is where to look. We want to look at a charging process or discharging process. When this one is changing, when, when, when this one is non zero, charge density is changing. So if it's charging, charge density increasing, discharging your charge density in decrease. So this is a charging capacitor, right? So let's look at a capacitor where you have some charge accumulate here. And when you run a current through, uh, these charge accumulates. So it's charging, sorry, a charging capacitor or it could be discharging, but we're just gonna look at one situation. So in this case, it's charging up, which means Q is building up. Um, and you can see that J dot into dA is not zero. This is the current running through. Um, you can see the charging place Current goes in and none comes out. The flux of J is not zero. So when you have a zero flux is when equal number of going in goes out, right? Whatever goes in also comes out, gives you zero flux. But in this case, current is going in, but none comes out. And uh, it is non-zero. So what is the net flux is the Q over dt, the change of uh, charge over time. Charge is changing now. Okay, so now let's see um, a couple of questions. So this is a charging capacitor. Um, we're interested in finding B on the ampere loop. This is our loop. So this is another way for us to see something is wrong with Ampere's law. So we have already showed previously um, what's wrong with Ampere's law by looking at the differential format, right? This is the integral format. We can also demonstrate there's something wrong with Ampere's law using the integral format. So let's look at the first question. If we were to compute the uh, Ampere loop, the B on the Ampere loop on this little dashed line, and you can see that uh, this is my left hand side and the current through is a current through uh, the cross section of some cross section and the cross section is defined by this loop. If I'm looking at this blue area, okay, what is the current through? I think I don't need to ask you to vote on this, right? Because this is pretty straightforward. What is the current through here? I. It's just I, yeah, very good. Okay, so you might wonder, okay, there's no problem here, right? Why do you say there's a problem? But now I present you a different situation because you can see there are many ways to view 
uh, AC. So this is a loop. And the current is running through some area. This area, what area? The area bounded by the loop. And you can see that how an area is bounded by a loop can change. If you take uh, a metal wire and dip it in soap, sometimes you will have uh, those membranes of the bubble uh, right across the wire, just like that, just like our blue surface area like this. That's an area bounded by the loop. But you can take the same metal wire and dip it in soap, right? Wiggle around, it will make a bubble. So the bubble is also another surface area bounded by this loop. They are bounded by the same DL, um, right? But you can see there are infinite amount of different ways to say what area it is. But so how do I look at the current here? Current through which area? If I, to, if I were to look at the current through this new area, you can see this is my new area, okay? The big bubble that's no longer here, it's over here. So you wanna look at the current through that area and what do you get? Okay, maybe take a um, minute or two to uh, discuss this particular question and then when you come back we can go.
Okay, 10 more seconds. All right, let's take a look at this together. All right, I'm gonna call, close this. So if you look at the now the bubble shaped blue area and you can see that what is occurring through it, uh, yes, it is indeed. Is there any current, does the current ever go through us? No current through it, right? Absolutely not, no. Right, it's stopped right here. So the current through this will be zero. Very good, C is correct, the correct answer. And you can see now, this is uh, very similar to before we have demonstrated a problem where Ampere's law, the old Ampere's law, is breaking down. So we need to fix it. How do we fix this? The Ampere law, Ampere's law breakdown seems to be, uh, in this case, you can see there is no current through this. But you can see that uh, there is a change over here. There is a change of charge. The current is no longer through this, but you have accumulated a charge, change of charge over time. So it looks like to make it to be correct, the left-hand side is not zero. The right-hand side right now, the current through is zero, but if we can multiply another term, maybe I can fix Ampere's law. So if I'm going to propose, uh, we're going to add a term to Ampere's law. I don't know what it is, but let's call it term X so that now it is going to be fixed. So let's try to fix Ampere's law. So I'm going to take the divergence on the left-hand side, and I'm going to take the divergence, of course, on the right-hand side. The left-hand side is zero always, and delta J is, according to charge conservation, is equal to negative d rho dt. So I know that uh, rho is epsilon naught times divergence of E. This is Gauss's law, I know this. So I'm going to plug in rho in here. I get uh, negative mu naught times epsilon naught uh, d dt divergence of E is equal to, uh, sorry, plus divergence of this unknown quantity is zero. So I can see what this quantity has to be, what it has to be. And you can already see what it has to be. It has to be uh, mu naught, epsilon naught, because the divergence doesn't matter with, with time, I take the divergence out to the other side. This is equal to the divergence of my unknown quantity. So you can see what my unknown quantity has to be. It has to be this guy. So let me modify my Maxwell equations and add mu naught, epsilon naught, the E, the T. I now have fixed it. This is a updated Ampere's law. So what this means physically, yes, you can produce a B field when you have a current. Current is the source for B field, but you can also have a B field when you have a change in electric field. A change in E field produce B. So a change in E produce B, a change in B produce E. So right, this gives Maxwell the inspiration of viewing how electromagnetic waves uh, is propagating in space by a changing E produce B and changing B produce E. So here you have full Maxwell equations, finally, if we modify the Ampere's law like this. So this is a complete set of um, Maxwell equations. Historically, uh, he had derived, defined this to be called a displacement current because it felt weird, right? This is a current, but this is not a current. So we force it to call it displacement, displacement current. 
But nowadays, we don't think there's necessary. Uh, it's really just the source of B field. You can have a change in E that produces a B. So now you got it. You got your full set of Maxwell equations. Uh, the last one is this guy. So we always write your R integral format for our Maxwell equation, right? So which one would be the correct integral format of this equation? Uh, this is our last question that we're going to vote on. Okay, so let's see quickly if we can vote on this. A hint when is just when it's just this, the integral format is this. This is what you are very familiar with. That's your ampere stop. So now we just need to modify the last little bit, right? Okay, um, 10 more seconds. All right, let's take a look. All right, so we can rule out, very good, B or B. Uh, we all know that the left-hand side should be something like this. And this is the current true. Now the question is, how do we modify the last term? You can see that from j to i, right? i is the integral of j dot into dA. This is your current density flowing through some area, give you the current. So this one needs the current is the surface integral. So this guy, you need that. You need also to make that into a surface integral to be. Um, in the uh, in integral format, right? So it has to be DDT, you can take it outside of the integral because these operations are independent. So it's the flux at E dot into DA and then time derivative with respect to time. Okay, so D is correct. Okay. okay, so these are your full set of Maxwell equations and these four equations are, they are valid when that are valid always, they're always true. Okay, so these are valid Maxwell equations and it's always true. No matter if you are doing static or non-static fields, or if your current is steady or non-steady, if you're in a matter or not in matter or in fact. So they're always valid. Okay, so that concludes our um, first semester of ENM, and that's all for uh, this class. I'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, I will go through the Friday's recitation material with you in class. I probably will be able to finish early. So, um, so because it's a class, I will just go through them, der derive it instead of having you working group. So we probably will have a little bit of time left um, after uh, our class on Wednesday. All right, I'll see you guys. Have a good rest of the day. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Thank you, goodbye. Dr. Ryan, do you mind if I see um, the integral format of, uh, of what we just derived again? Yes, it's here. Uh, okay. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Ryan. We'll see you Wednesday.